and I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Caregivers Israel. Uh, Caregivers Israel uh, is an NGO, a non-for-profit uh, association that uh, uh, promotes uh, awareness uh, and services for family caregivers in Israel. Um, I'm very happy that we're uh, uh, hosting this uh, webinar today. It's our first webinar in English and for the English speaker uh, population. And uh, for us, uh, it's a big uh, excitement. Tamar was uh, one of our leading volunteers in our counseling center. Uh, the manager of the counseling center, Shlomit, is here too. And uh, you will have uh, later all the uh, links uh, if uh, somebody wants uh, uh, to hear us. To... Okay. Did everybody hear me? It's okay. Just nod with your head, maybe. It's okay. You were heard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we started recording. So, uh, Tamar, it's your stage. Thank you. And uh, feel comfortable. And let's start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tamar. As you can see, my name is Tamar Meisel. I live in the north of Israel. I've been working as a life coach, a life and medical coach for over 10 years. A medical coach, many people know what a life coach is. A medical coach is someone who is a life coach, but in, when there's a family health issue, usually a chronic issue that changes the situation. Um, medical coaches, myself included, work with different members of the family. I primarily work with the caregiver, the person who is the person who takes care of that person who is ill or injured or whose life has changed because of the illness. Um, is Aviva, I just want to make sure that Aviva is I'm here. Available? Yeah. I'm available. Aviva, I'm not Aviva can you tell us about yourself? Great. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so I'm super excited to be doing this. I, um, we also, yes, we plan a series of webinars and we're really excited to working, as we said, with caregivers. I, I run uh, something called Health Advise, which focuses just on uh, health advocacy. And uh, I've been doing that for, let's say, the past 15 years in Israel, uh, working with several nonprofits and also independently. And uh, Tamar and I have teamed up now to get the word out a bit more about how people can help themselves uh, in the field of <clears throat> advocating for themselves as well as the emotional aspects that uh, fit into that. So take it away. So, thank you. Thank you very much everyone for joining us for this um, 50 minute adventure through our lives. What we want to talk with you about is when's, how do you evaluate that your parent needs a different kind of care or needs care in general? What are your options? What are your options and what are your parents' options? How does this connect the situation? What should you know as the person responsible more often, this is the person that we're, we're talking with primarily, the person, what should you know about finding a live-in caregiver? And how do you feel about what's going on? What's going on with you as your family situation has changed? I want to start with giving a little bit of terminology. And also, I want, before I go into the terminology, I want to point out that feel free to write in the chat box. Aviva is on the chat box while I'm talking, and I'm going to be on the chat box while she's talking. And if in the, in the meantime, we'd appreciate it if you stayed on mute so that we don't have any of the interfering noises that we all have become very aware of with um, the internet. So a little bit of terminology. A caregiver can either be someone who's paid or unpaid. We've often called a professional caregiver, even though sometimes we all know that that caregiver is not professional. But a caregiver is paid or unpaid and with or without formal training. It can be a member of a person's social network. In other countries, it's also called a carer, sometimes a caretaker, even though I hear the word personally, I'm from America, I hear the word caretaker and it, it does wrong with me because the caretaker is also, we all know someone who works in a cemetery. So let's call it, for this, we're gonna call it caregiver or care, carer. 
And it's mostly, it's most commonly used to address impairments related to old age, disability, disease, or mental order. It's also very often the caregiver is, can be a partner who's taking care of his or her partner, or a parent who's taking care of a child with special needs, and even a parent who's taking care of a child without special needs. Um, are dedicated to those who have a parent who needs to be taken care of. Well, primary caregiver is a family member, usually, who takes primary responsibility for someone, and that person cannot take care of him or herself. And we've added on this slide the word parent, who is more often than not the natural caregiver, because a parent is, a care, is the caregiver of the offspring. And what happens when we start talking about caregiving or taking care of our parents, the family situation changes. We become a lot of times what we would expect or what our parents were for us or differently. And there's a whole lot of emotional issues that are connected to that. So when your parents need care, what do you have to find out? What do you have to do? It's all of a sudden this thing happens in your life. And um, even when you expect it, it's often all of a sudden. First thing is, what is your parents' mental and physical state? What did your parent want? What, if you could possibly talk to them about it, what do they want? Who is available? What is available? And I remind you always to breathe, to breathe deep as the situation changes, to share with, if there's anything you can share with anyone, excuse me very much, give space to your feelings and to what's going on with you, be conscious of what's happening and get help. Aviva? Yes. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, specifics because often I get asked, uh, people say they have a feeling that they think that their parents might need more assistance um, or they're not sure what's going on with them, but it's often a vague feeling. Um, and unfortunately I see that often it comes late in the game, meaning there already might've been an injury, there might've been a fall, or there's already a concern that your parent isn't um, taking care of themselves physically, showering, etc. Excuse oh, me. No, I no worries. I, no worries. So what we want to do is, first of all, we want to focus on some key points. So this is very helpful also for us in terms of evaluating, but also because the assistance that we are eligible for, both through the government or through uh, private organizations, let's say if we have long-term care through the Coupa, are based on these type of daily physical activities. So we need to make sure uh, when, we, when we're talking to other people, whether it's a doctor or we're talking to a social worker or somebody from Bitu Lumi, that we are communicating with them in the language that they speak. What does that mean? It means you, they want to know about your, your parents' daily physical activities. How able are they to walk around by themselves? Do they need a cane? Do they need a walker? Do they need to hold on to somebody? How are they able to dress themselves uh, or uh, take a shower by themselves? Or do they need a little bit of assistance? Do you see, often you'll see a, your, a, a parent who is not showering and then you might realize it's because they're scared of getting in and out of the tub. So these are things to, to recognize. Are they brushing their teeth? Um, other, other things that they're going to look for, can they do the laundry? Can they go do shopping for themselves? Are they able to do basic things like wash the dishes um, and prepare food for themselves? And the final thing, which often I see that children are more reluctant to ask their parents, but is crucial when trying to figure out what's going on, is what is happening financially? Meaning uh, for those people, unfortunately, who will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia is that one of the first things to notice is the erratic nature of purchases. So um, do you suddenly see that your parents aren't making it through the month? 
or that your mother suddenly started donating to, uh, you know, the Wildlife Society and, um, you know, adopt a guinea pig and other, other places that she didn't beforehand. So those are often things that you sort of need to keep your eye on. And this is the gentle balance that Tamara and I will talk about in the future, but you need to ask the questions that you might not have always felt comfortable asking before. And obviously there has to be an element of respect and, and, um, and keeping also the parent-child relationship distance, at least initially, but trying to find out more information. And the other take home point that I wanna mention, which we'll summarize at the end, is write it down. When we go back, if you can go back to the other slide for just a second, when we talk okay. about um, the uh, evaluating, write down what you see and keep a record. It could be that that week was a fluke, uh, and it could be that you're actually seeing uh, a level of decline in functioning that you will then need to sort of step up the level of in intervention and subsequent daily care for your parents. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, when we decide that our parents need some kind of intervention, and we're focusing on Israel for the most part, we have two basic options. Either we're looking for full-time care, sometimes that can help, that happens quickly, whether there's a fall or your parent has a chronic illness like Parkinson's, but suddenly there's a, a rapid decline. Uh, and then your choices are either putting a having your parent go live in an assisted living facility, which is different than independent living, and that's important, again, in terms of the terminology. Uh, assisted living means what we call a nursing home in sort of the non-politically correct speak. Uh, or we bring in a live-in caregiver, which in Israel is um, the more people choose that, in that it's a more affordable option to have live-in care than, let's say, a place like the United States. Uh, on the other side, if you don't feel that your parents need full-time care, uh, I was speaking to somebody today who, uh, his mother needs assistance in keeping the house clean and doing some shopping. She had a fall a year before, so she's not so stable, but if, uh, walking wise, but she's still 100% and wants her independence and needs her independence. So there your options are to have a Tuach Lumi funded carer, uh, who comes in on an hourly basis, depending on the level of cares that you're eligible for. Uh, or you can hire somebody privately. And uh, as long as they are a resident of Israel and you can pay them and you pay their bituach lumi and that's fully legal. And the other option I didn't put down, what can be an option is uh, hours in a day center. For example, they're what they call um, milkaz yom uh, for, for pe older people. You can have it... Um, for people who just want more social stimulation and there are activities, there are trips. Uh, now in the days of Corona, it's got definitely gotten a bit more complicated, but they have gone, they have done virtual. Uh, or if your parent is suffering from some type of cognitive decline, then there is the program of uh, Milabev uh, in the Jerusalem area and some other programs around the country that also offer day programming. Okay, and as again, as Tamar said, please feel free to write questions in the chat. If, uh, if it's relevant to the slide, we can answer. If not, we'll answer at the end, but uh, please don't hesitate to, to ask your questions. Okay, let's go on. Um, okay, so these are just some important things. And again, this is obviously a much more long and involved process when we say, uh, when we realize that we want to uh, ascertain what kind of living situation we want for our parent. But in general, these are categories that you're going to need to deal with. So if you're looking for an assisted living facility, first of all, you want to know, is it public or is it private? If your parents don't have the financial capabilities uh, to pay for a private uh, living, yeah, private assisted living, which is in the vicinity of um, it can be anywhere between around 16 to 20,000 shekels a month, um, depending, again, there's a variety, uh, more expensive in the center than up north. Uh, and for some reason, which um, is confusing to me, but the centers up north around where, uh, where Tamar lives, I find are much, uh, I don't know, much nicer and more affordable than certainly in the Jerusalem area. I'm not sure how that, uh, that happened. 
Um, but uh, an important thing to note also is that in Israel, the family is the center of many things, including taking care of the parents. So if you decide, you and your parents decide that a, an assisted living um, uh, uh, situation is necessary to them, then Misrata Briut, the Ministry of Health, does ask the children if and how they can participate financially in the care of the assisted living. Now, it's not as if it was, there's are ways to, to um, there's a question and it doesn't mean you'll naturally will be paying for that, but you should just know that that is par for the course, a question that they will ask. The other thing that's very important to find out, and I hear this from a lot of people, is they go and they find this lovely facility for their parent, and they're very pleased. Um, but what they don't realize is that because their mother was diagnosed, let's say, with Alzheimer's and she has cognitive decline, that particular place won't accept her because they, uh, because people who have cognitive decline and who are going to need what they call a safe place are not eligible for irregular assisted living facility, and that's very important. Uh, again, if they're, let's say, after, uh, after a fracture, after an extended hospitalization, they might also not be eligible to go into a regular assisted living facility, and that's something that you need to ask uh, beforehand. If you are thinking about bringing somebody into your parents' residence, then a few things to think about is where does your parent live? Uh, for example, uh, somebody came to me and they were very interested in having uh, their parent provide, get assistance at home, but they lived um, at the borders of the Golan. So having somebody come in on a not full-time live-in basis to find a suitable person would be much more difficult than let's say if you live in the center of Tel Aviv. So that's important to, to note. Also is do your parents have um, a steady income? Are they living on a pension, um, IRA benefits, or are they living only on social security? And did they make Aliyah after um, they hit the age of pension because that also will determine what they're eligible for for the government. And most importantly, or not most importantly, but for sure, one of the issues is, um, do does one of your parents have a diagnosis that is degenerative? Meaning, um, if your parent is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, the chances of them continuing along the same plane with no change are very, very slim. So this is the time when you need to plan ahead and you need to say, now they are at this functioning level, but with time, I know there will be a decline. And obviously that has a whole nother emotional component to it and, and sort of acknowledging things that will happen. It doesn't mean that they have to happen, but we need to put that into our thinking. Meaning if your parent has Parkinson's and you find a fantastic independent living facility with them, but it's not very accessible and it doesn't have a, um, a place for somebody who has more cognitive and physical disabilities, that might not be the best choice for its two year plan. So something to uh, think about. All right, so let's move on to our next slide. Okay, so now we talk about um, if we have a, um, our, if we decide to go to part-time care. Now, if our parent uh, has limited financial means or even a, a social security, but that is pretty much it, then chances are they will be eligible for assistance of some kind from Bituach Lumi. But it's very important to remember about Bituach Lumi. Unlike other insurance agents and or insurance um, policies, and because we live in uh, Eretz Israel and we have socialized medicine and we have a, a state that worries about our welfare for those of us who came from the United States, I think more than the United States, uh, we have the option to access services from Bituach Lumi. However, Bituach Lumi has two criteria, financial and medical, meaning that your parent has to meet the medical criteria for somebody who needs assistance, and that goes back to our slide about activities of daily living, and they also need to meet the financial criteria that they are not making more than X amount of money per month, uh, which for a single person is different than, uh, I think it's 13,000, the maximum. And I think for a couple, it's 21,000 shekels per month, but don't count, you know, don't hold me to that. And it's a different 
presentation. And uh, also it changes obviously with inflation. But I tell people, just fill out the forms, apply. See, nothing bad will happen if you fill out the forms and they tell you that you're not eligible. Then what they will do is most of the time they will send somebody to your parent to evaluate them about their, again, the activities of daily living. Uh, and you can see, I'm not gonna read the slide to you, but the level of care is determined on certain points that you get during the evaluation. Now, point to know here is that, um, you know, people tell me if your parent is 88 years old and thank God they are walking and dressing and being independent, you're right. They might, even though they're 88 years old, they might actually score very few points from the evaluation and not be eligible for so many hours from Bituach Lumi. That's how it is. Once your parent hits 90, even if they have the same level of functioning, Bituach Lumi will often give you more points just for being over 90. So I also tell people apply afterwards, even if you were initially rejected or had fewer hours uh, before the age of 90. Now, in addition, you can get somebody through Bituach Lumi, and those are through hours or cash, uh, or you can hire someone. For example, let's say your husband um, or your father um, only wants to be taken care of by a man, meaning he needs help in the shower, but he is not, he's completely there, and he doesn't want uh, a woman to be to be helping him in the shower. And you know that down the street, there's a young man who just graduated from college and is, has a few hours available. You can hire him as offering this type of assistance on an hourly basis. Uh, you can either hire him privately or you can use the monies from Bituach Lumi. And as long as you report that to Bituach Lumi, uh, then that is a fine uh, way to handle the situation. Remember, that person must be an Israeli citizen or have permanent residence meaning the caregiver who helps your person, who helps your neighbor down the street and has some extra hours, legally is not an option for you to use for your father for a few hours a week. Okay, moving on. Breathe. <laughs> I'm trying to get everything in. <laughs> Breathe it. <laughs> um, and I should just point out, uh, if, if, for the lovely lady who is in all of these pictures, if you hadn't noticed, it's the same lady. This is that. This is my mother, actually, uh, and my mother has Alzheimer's dementia, and uh, she moved here three years ago, and now I am her primary caregiver. So, in addition to having much professional experience with this, uh, I I experienced the personal trials and tribulations of being a primary caregiver to your parent. Uh, so I get it. There's nothing else to say. <laughs> But uh, that's, it's, it's a challenge. Other things that we want to take into account, let's say that we think our parent is eligible for somebody to live with us. We need to, are they eligible for a foreign worker to come live with them? And that again is dependent on the activities. Do they have disposable income that will be able to pay directly for this care? Do they have enough space for a caregiver to live in? Meaning you don't need an actual physical bedroom in order to legally have a caregiver, but you have to have a certain amount of space where they can have a bed and a dresser that's their own. Um, very important, who is going to manage the caregiver? I get this question all the time because I think that people think because they hired somebody who's in a, um, somebody who's in the, um, through the agency, then they think that, do you mind just muting that person, Shlomi, maybe? Somebody who came in, maybe? If, um, if you uh, hire an agency, that agency does not manage the caregiver. That means if they do not negotiate with them days off, how, what are they gonna do, what are they not gonna do, what are their responsibilities, et cetera. That really comes down to the employer, which is usually one of the children, because even though technically your parent is the employer, you are the one who has to interface with them. And really to asking your parent to interface with the caregiver or your, the other parent uh, is, is tricky and doesn't usually work. 
just another, and again, this is a whole nother workshop, but just remember, just like you go to work and you get uh, 12 days off of vacation or what is it, 12 now or 14? No, I think it's 12 days. And you get sick days off and you get the mevra, I mean, you need that wellness care at the end of your first 12 months and subsequent every year and you get pension, so does the caregiver, just like an Israeli employee. So that's uh, important to note when you are figuring out costs and negotiation and management of the caregiver. All right, are we going to the next slide? Yep, and there we go. Okay, I think this is my final slide before uh, Tamara's gonna go back to, uh, to the emotional aspects of things, but these are crucial aspects that you need to think about. Again, this is, we're kind of just touching on the base points here um, because we wanna put them out there to get people more food for thought. But when you are starting to intervene on your parents' care on behalf of your parents, even if it's not a full-time situation, you need to have legal documents in place. Meaning, do you have a durable power of attorney, which I forgot to put in here in uh, transliteration is Ipui Koach Mit Mashech, which is different than your standard power of attorney uh, and gives you the ability to act on your parents' behalf. Um, even if they are not able to make decisions for themselves in that moment, which is very, very important. And who will be um, in charge of the interactions with the caregiver? And who will be in charge of making the health decisions for your parents? So for example, often what you'll have is you'll have three siblings, right? One lives in the United States and two lives here. One is an accountant and the other one is an art teacher. So often what you will see is that the child who is the accountant will take on the financial power of attorney and the child who's the art teacher will often be the one who uh, goes to the visits and will be in charge of making the health decisions. But I strongly, strongly recommend that at the beginning of this process, you sit down with your siblings and hopefully your parents and have a discussion about what your parents' desires are in terms of health decisions going forward, and who is responsible for what. Meaning you don't wanna be in a crisis situation when your parent is in the hospital and suddenly the siblings are having an argument about whether this intervention, whether your parent should be on a feeding tube or not. It's very important to have those situations not in crisis. Okay, I think this is you. Okay, thank you so much, Aviva. Thank you so much information. And I, it's always so hard to hear it. And um, I think even more often than not, when we hear it in Hebrew, then we don't even understand the words. And with all the emotion and all of the words and all of the information, it's really hard. And um, thank you. And I think, and what you said at the end is so very important that people take the time with their parents while they still can and understand what their parents want, what they want, what's possible, to do the Ipui Kofmet Mashech. These things are so important, as much as you can get done before. Um, and even we should, I, I believe we should do them now. Everyone who's on this call, before you really need it for your parents, you should do it for yourselves. But that's a whole other thing also. What happens is that often, well, we're, this whole workshop is, this whole webinar is about when our parents need care, we become the caregivers. One out of every three Israelis cares for a loved one. According to the statistics, 36% of those people care for a parent. Just crazy. We care for our parents. I've heard often the sentence that in your lifetime, you will, oh, you will either be a caregiver, cared for, or someone who needs care. And it's so important that we deal with the emotional and other aspects that that are around the caregiving. One of the most important things, and Aviva mentioned it when she spoke about the siblings, is who is your team? Who is on the team as you're working? Who can help you? Who can help you understand things? Who can you ask for help? And who can you ask for, and, and also, who will you be willing to accept assistance from? On this slide, we have the individual and we have the, the immediate circle around them is the paid caregiver we spoke about before, which is can either be someone who lives with you, with lives with the parent or doesn't, the family members, the primary caregiver, who's probably the person on this call, and friends. And I want to invite you to look at this slide 
that sometimes it's your parent who's the individual and sometimes you, the caregiver, are that individual. And I want for a second to invite you to think about the fact that when you start taking care of your parent, there's a lot of emotional stuff that happens because the power of life or the circle of life has kind of shifted. You've gone from being someone that your parent takes care of to someone who you often need to take care of them. There's, and for many families, there's a, an issue of the distance. You know, you want to respect them. Their will is what they're, there's so many ways that we've been brought up in so many different family situations. No matter what it is, it shifts very, very much, or almost completely, the moment that we need to take care of our parents. Um, my mother's 82. She doesn't need a caregiver. She doesn't want to hear about it. And it's always in my mind that something will happen, maybe. And how do we take care of the things that need to be taken care of in advance? And I think that for this situation, it's important that when things happen, we've taken care of what needs to be taken care of. And we also know in our minds, and we've written down, we know who do we contact? Who will give, who can help us? Where are your siblings? If you have siblings, where are they on this? Do they support you? Do they not support you? Can you ask them for help? Can you rely on them? Who's the pharmacist? If you know who these people are in the outer circle of your, pa of your parents, your life becomes a lot easier. If you know who the therapists are, what therapists they like, what therapists they don't like, these are things that before, you, before it's a crisis, you should know. And when it's a crisis, you have to know. And I want to invite you also to allow yourself to feel the emotions that go on with being all of a sudden and not all of a sudden, but the process from being a child who's often taken care of to being a parent, a, a parent, to being the child who's taken care of the parent comes with a lot of emotions. There are initial reactions, which are often, and I gave some examples, fear. How can I take care of this? There's so much. It's overwhelming. Aviva gave in a few slides so much information. How can someone possibly take it all in? It's fear and a lot of times also there's grief there's a sadness there's um a feeling that what you knew is gone it's no longer and so those those fear those initial reactions they're very 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 natural and um we invite you to feel them allow yourself to feel them Along with the initial reactions, there's also, there are also ongoing reactions of sadness, of anger and frustration. And these reactions are like, it's like a roller coaster. You can, everything can be going fine and then one day something can slowly happen or you can see someone in the street or something and all of a sudden you are overwhelmed with feelings. And we invite you as caregivers to, to let yourself feel it. Of course, not all of the time and every day, but to, to make time for that. Taking care of someone other than yourself, taking care of yourself, first of all, in this society has a lot of stress. <laughs> For the average person, there's a lot of stress. When you have to take care of someone else, there's even more stress. Um, sometimes there's stress because you don't know if and how you can tell the people that you work with. It's not really often the thing to say. You can say, I have to take care of my mother or I have to take care of my father. But when you go out too often, how do you manage that conversation? So along with that conversation, there's a lot of stress. Sibling situations create a lot of stress. Not knowing what they're going to do, having to go with them to a doctor's appointment, seeing the forms in Hebrew, just opening, going to the Batula Flumi website. I think for someone who speaks fluent Hebrew is overwhelming. Certainly for someone who, who doesn't. Um, we invite you to be conscious of your stressors and to notice some of the physical reactions that happen and change. Blood pressure can change, heart rate can change, body temperature, breathing rate, the emotional reactions, we spoke about some of them. Some of the behavioral reactions that, that happen are that all of a sudden we become, you know, we become aggressive or we start crying or we start become nervous or we can become very passive. And some of the mental reactions that we have, and this is all because we're taking care of someone else who we didn't plan to take care of them 
or even if we planned to, we didn't really, it was impossible to see what was gonna happen. And I wanna point out that even if you've in the past taken care of your one parent, and now you're taking care of the other parent, it's a whole new cycle. Even though you have the experience and some of it you learned, it's still in a whole new cycle and we want you to be conscious of those stressors. Because when you're conscious of them, you can understand them and you can take care of them, you can handle them. And we invite you to get help. I mean, there are lots of organizations. As Rachel said, I volunteered for caregivers a long time ago and um, I met Aviva through caregivers. There are lots of kinds of help. There's patient advocates. Well, there's one that I know of, but there's, there's Aviva. <laughs> There are several medical coaches and other people who provide support and both emotional and decide. Basically, as I said before, a medical coach in the new situation helps you decide what helps you make the decisions, helps you clarify the issues that are the questions that are going on in your mind, and helps you focus on the answers that you want, that you yourself want. And there are lots of additional resources. In English, there aren't so many, but we'd like to recommend two organizations that we work with also. Um, Get Help Israel, which has a um, which has a catalog of people who work with them, of professionals who they work with, and also there's several Facebook groups. For instance, the Sandwich Generation. We're going to be sending this out to everyone who's given them emails, so you'll get all of this information. You'll get the PDF with these resources on um, by email. Okay. Right. And get help. Okay. Get help is, is it's in general for mental health professional to have access to a mental health professional who speaks English. Right. So it's right. not that it's specific, but you know, if you feel that you need to speak to somebody professionally. And and also, but also amongst the mental health, it's a lot of time there are people who deal with people whose parents have dementia, and other. Okay. And so and 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 there are several support groups. There are lots of English speaking support groups in the United States and in England online. Um, in Israel, there are a few, you can kind of look for them. Um, there are very few, most of them are in Hebrew. And even those are very few. Um, okay. And we want to give you a few tips that we want, you, we want to advise you to take home. I'll start and then I'll pass it on to Aviva. <laughs> the first one is acknowledge your feelings and share it with a professional person or with a support group. Acknowledge what you're going through. It's really natural. It's completely natural. And, it, and once it was considered a natural situation that we take care of our parents and over the past, I think, few decades, it's become kind of unnatural and now we're going back to it. In Israel, it's very different than in the United States. In Israel, the family is very, very close together and it's actually the family's responsibility first and foremost. And so we, we want you to acknowledge, we advise you, we advise you, we recommend, we invite you to acknowledge your feelings and to give them legitimacy, to identify your stressors, to create your team, and your team can change as time goes on, but to create your team, to know who is on your team to be, and to share the responsibilities and ask for help. And more importantly than asking for it, accept it. Aviva. Yeah, so my, my take home tips, I think, are a bit easier than yours. <laughs> They're more practical, some of them. So as I mentioned, keep a diary for that week. Write it down. Don't just base it on, I think that something is changing with my parents. Keep, keep track of it. It really can help you focus on what the issues are. Take the legal steps necessary before things become a crisis. Find a lawyer who speaks English. Right now, durable power of attorney is really only available through a lawyer, unlike getting um, a health proxy for end-of-life decision-making, which you can do with forms through the Ministry of Health. But the general uh, power of attorney, uh, durable power of attorney, is still through a lawyer. Um, now I'm going to come to the difficult one. Uh, is that try to discuss what we call end of life issues before it becomes a crisis. Now, obviously I realize that this is not an easy thing to do. However, ask your parents simple things as if, you know, and a comment, where, where would you, do you think that you'd like to be buried? If you have a, if your parent is living here, but their spouse is actually buried in their home country, 
it could be that your parent is it's very clear to them that you're gonna fly them back and and they will be buried there which is reasonable but that has to be discussed first um because there's are there are logistics involved in that if you um you you know that your parent um will not want any intervention if something happens to them but you and your siblings are very clear that you would want to intervene if an end of a life situation have the discussion now if you can't have it uh together by yourself sometimes actually there are social workers um through the coupa i always say start with the easiest thing through the coupa volume there's some great social workers there who can actually have that conversation with you sometimes the nurse if you're having home hospice or home just a home health care uh they can have that discussion meaning even though it's a bit uncomfortable don't avoid it because having the discussion in the hospital corridor when your parent is unconscious in the hospital room is much more challenging and much more painful so uh that is my my take home tip for those and uh and i think so we we're nearing the end of our, our allotted time with the webinar and i'm just going to right now as i talked to you i put in the notes uh we wanted to continue this discussion with you we brought up some uh very minimal issues that um sort of the, the tip of the iceberg to get you to sort of start the conversation for those people who are interested in continuing the conversation more in depth we've put together another series of four webinars um and um for i what uh, i just want to point out that the that it's not caregivers caregivers has given us this incredible platform exactly completely this, right but it's not they Exactly. We, they yeah, gave they us the opportunity to have this discussion and it could be that we will do another free webinar through caregivers on another topic related to this in the future. Um in order to continue this conversation, we we suggest to you if you want to join with us and continue the discussion either with webinars or through an online support group because as Tamar said what we both realized is that there are uh, very few support groups that exist for English speakers in Israel. Uh, I myself um had did not find one when i was looking i found that the support groups were for uh spouses of people but for somebody who was caring for a parent i didn't find that so we put it in the in the chat and we will send you this pdf which i hope will be a guide for you guys if you registered and we have your email uh and you can um you can always contact us and you know feel free to look at the the link 